No metrics. Uh, this is not a no estimates talk. Anyone familiar with no estimates? Okay, cool. No metrics is the spiritual sibling, but I won't be talking about estimation. I'll be talking about making metrics valuable. No in the no movement is pronounced not only. Okay, so that, that's just something you need to keep in mind. Uh, anyone that's been involved in a metrics effort know that it's sort of an uphill battle. Uh, at least that's how I felt at many times. And I want you to, to imagine a scenario where you walk into a smallish development shop, 20-ish people, and you walk in as a coach and they want some process advice. And they tell you, oh, you start, you start prodding around and you start asking, so what's your velocity? Because you've heard that that's a good thing to know. And they say, we don't know. Okay. And you go to a board and you ask them, so what's the estimates on these things? And they say, well, we don't know. We don't do estimates. So how do you track productivity? Well, we just deliver stuff. Are you feeling something like that? These guys are seriously falling off the horse. You've walked into the development department that I've been leading for the prior four or five years. Uh, I've just switched to another company, but that wasn't due to me falling off the horse. It was due to me finding a bigger challenge. Uh, <clears throat> that's me running around. I do a lot of that. That's also why I sort of tend to wander a bit. I run around different communities collecting ideas on how to improve things. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as DrunkCod. If you want to contact me, well, you just shout at DrunkCod.com. You can also smile if you like me or something like that. I think flirt also works. Uh, since I really want to say that I'm a developer, I also got a GitHub account. So, but I do manage a lot of things. So, <coughs> background. Why are we here? Or why did I sort of start to try to figure this thing out with metrics and with decision making? I found that as a developer, it doesn't, didn't actually mean, matter much how much magic I worked with machine. It didn't actually influence the bottom line. So I thought, oh well, I'll just debug the system because that's what we techies do. So I went into man the management literature and I started figuring out, okay, so how do I actually sort of manage a system? And there's a really, there's a ton of good ideas. Most of them are centered on stuff like this. Anyone knows, know who the dapper fellow in the background is? That's Bill Hewlett of Hewlett and Packet. That used to be a very successful company. He used to be a very, uh, he's a very successful man. What happened to the company afterwards, I don't know. You also find great gurus, like Drucker saying, what gets measured gets managed. And this all makes so much sense, doesn't it? And what I felt was missing were the needs. Why do we need to do that? And how will this actually help us attend to the, info, to the need of people? And how will it help me? I started a journey trying to figure out some of those needs via software metrics. Because I rose up and I'm a tech lead. And software metrics are great, they tell you, because you can sort of control your architecture. If you have 20 people running around doing stuff, and you want to ensure that, it actually, that it's sustainable, and you have those ideas in, in your backpack, then you think, well, what I'll do is that I'll dive into the research regarding software metrics. Anyone done that? There's a ton of very fun stuff you can find. You can find stuff like what's the coupling between components, and uh, how these things correlate with lines of code. And when you find out, but what you find out if you spend a few years with this is that if you take all the studies on software metrics, and then you sort of uh, compensate for outlying factors. The biggest, best correlation on system complexity is the metric everyone hates. It's lines of code. <clears throat> but you can also do other fun stuff. If you're very good at software metrics and if you build a few tools or if you buy Endepend or Structure Map or something, or uh, Structure 101, you can start digging into a code base. You can start understanding the history of it. You can collect historical data and you can mine it and you can see the big seismic events in that code base history. You can see when uh, units were formed or disformed, when 
different things happen. And that's all very useful. And as a leader, as a manager, as someone trying to help people meet their needs, it's all in the past. You feel like Indiana Jones. You're spelunking through a code base. You collect, you're finding uh, a lot of numbers. But the information you really need, you can get in a different way. What would that be? Well, you can take a cup of coffee. And you can go over to your teams and can say, stop. What's happening? And you can start pairing with them. And you can start finding the behaviors that drives the quality you need. And then all of a sudden, all of that time you spent being Indiana Jones feels slightly wasted. So don't do that. Or, well, you can do research, but that's a different thing. What we need to understand is, as soon as we start measuring things, we need to consider the ethics of what we're doing. If you're in a position of power, you'll be influencing people, and your first and foremost responsibility should be to do no harm. You should do no harm to those around you and to your customers. We heard a lot of talk about customers today, so what's a customer? Please jump forward. That would be very helpful right now. There's supposed to be a very cute dog on the next slide. Oh, there it comes. So, our customers are those whose lives we touch. Anyone who actually influenced by our actions and that are the receivers of our work are our customers. That's not only end users, that's the people in your team. If you're a developer, that's operations. Operations are your customer. We need to think about those, and we need to figure out how does measuring influence them. And then we can sort of start deciding what to measure. We can also do like, this is Tom Gilb. If, if there's anything you need to know about quantification, talk to Tom. Um, and he told me that one, of ma one major reason for quantification is clarification. If we can put a number on it, we can communicate. There's also a lot of other reasons for quantifying stuff and measuring them. It's a way to create a work standard, a baseline. You can use it for research. But clarification should be <coughs> at the center of any measuring effort. The only reason to quantify, or, or one major reason, shouldn't misquote him, is to actually gain clarity about what we're doing. It's a, communication, it's a communicative device. What that also means is that if we want that, we need to make sure that this data is always relevant. We need to keep the relevance of the measures we employ. And that has an interesting implication, because if we destroy that information, we'll actually be shooting ourselves in the foot. This is Charles Goodhart. He used to sort of advise your government on financial issues, and he stated this. Any observed statistical regularity will tend to collapse once pressure is placed upon it for control purposes. He said this about economic devices, it's true in every setting. And is it very clear to you what it actually means? Marilyn Stratton actually reformulated in a way that's actually a bit more comprehensible. When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Setting targets is very, very destructive. You can actively destroy information and hurt people by doing it. I'm being very cheerful today, ain't I? OK, we'll soon get to the fun stuff. OK, so what we need to understand is that there's multiple types of measurements. And if we want to actually use measures well and use them as a basis for decision making, we need to be able to distinguish between them. So we have motivational measures. These are the ones that your boss employ on the yearly performance review. The sort of the story to understand this goes like something like, uh, well, one day Charles Schwab was walking a <coughs> to a work group actually pouring iron ingots, and he stands there for a minute and, 
then take a piece of chalk, 78, or some other interesting number, on, on the bricks. And then he walks away, and he works him sort of goes, hmm, interesting. He comes back the next day, that number has been crossed out, a new number has been put in its place, and it's higher. And from there we got the brilliant idea that if we measure stuff, people will produce more. Does this actually work in practice? Mm. We know what happens, we start gaming the system, we don't actually feel very motivated about most motivational measures. There's carrots and sticks, and that's all there is. We also have informational measures. These are the measures we create for ourselves, the data we collect to be able to actually decide things. What's interesting about this is, as a leader, you don't get to decide how people will perceive it. Informational measures are actually very useful. But if you're collecting something and the people actually get the data getting that gathered, if the people actually perceive it to be in a con for a controlling purpose, it will devolve into a motivational measure, it will become toxic, and you'll lose the information. What we need to focus on is leading indicators. A leading indicator is anything we can influence by our own actions, and actually sort of for chopping down the proverbial tree, we believe that chopping the axe will make that go faster, so we do that, we can see it directly. It's something I can influence, and I got an underlying theory saying that if I do more of this thing, good things will follow. Lagging indicator is like Grumpy Cat. That's your customer calling you up and saying, your system sucks. We can't influence those. We can't work on them, on them directly. The only thing we can work on directly are the leading indicators. You need to figure out what your leading indicators are. You need to work on those. You need to develop a theory of action and a theory of measurement. So, how do we often fall off the horse regarding measurement? Here are some of my favorite stories. Burn downs. Anyone doing those? Okay, so anyone ever seen a team do burn downs, conclude that, ooh, we're going to miss, and then just merrily go along and do whatever they did beforehand? Have you seen it happen multiple iterations? So why the hell are you collecting that data? If you're not acting on it, you're just burning people's lives. You're collecting data, you're not acting on it. That's wrong. Start with the need. Velocity, another favorite of mine. Anyone use velocity? Yes. Anyone think that it's a sensible metric? Okay. Some people actually say that, well, the best metric there is is velocity, and I know how to double your velocity. Yes, double the number, it's very easy. Uh, <coughs> As soon as, velocity is a great measure as soon as it's, as long as it's informational. As long as we as a group use it, it's great. As soon as it gets sort of under external control, it devolves into nothingness. Story points. Ah, oh, well, <coughs> Doggy Bear once said, well, you better cut the pizza into four slices because I'm not hungry enough to eat six. <laughs> That's how we developers do with stories. It's actually a sort of, you can slice them any way you want. We can fudge them. As, uh, when they become an external control mechanism, they just sort of devolve. I can tell you tons of things about story points, why they, why they are leaky abstraction, they don't actually work. They're numbers you can't add up, you can't multiply them. They're distributions, it's just, it doesn't make any sense at all. <sighs> code coverage. I've done this. I've gotten my code under coverage, I've destroyed the system doing it. As, Code coverage is a really good uh, <coughs> indicator if you did things right. If you sort of go away, write some code, then take a code coverage report, it will tell you how well you're adhering to your testing practices. That's good. Once you make code coverage a uh, target, people start writing very wonky code just to exercise parts of your system that should have been tested anyway. And you also destroyed information about how you were actually performing. So what do we do? I got 10 minutes to tell you how to actually solve all of these problems. Great, eh? Okay, so models are broken. Here's a useful one. This is from uh, Larry Macaroni at Rally. Uh, <coughs> it's called ODIM. Yeah, and ODIM stands for, we need to focus on the outcomes we want. What do we desire? What are our needs as a group? 
the outcomes we want is the result of something. They're the results of decisions made. The decisions we make need something to support them. What do they need? They need information. The information we need to, to take the decisions needed to, ta to be taken, uh, to reach the behaviors and outcomes we need, those are based on metrics. So we should always start with what do we want, what are decisions, what information do we need, and then, and only then, select a metric to actually give you the information. And discard it as soon as you're done. More on decisions. So in collaboration with this very fine human being, hi Kim, <coughs> we started talking about, well, how do we sort of externalize decision making in a way that we can actually talk about it in a decent way? And we came up with this. This might not fit your context. We know that it fits my context of small development teams, and it seems to fit for pretty big organization with something like, what, 30,000 employees or something. You might be outside of those parameters, so this might be completely irrelevant. Uh, but what you do is that you take a stakeholder, you sit down with him, and you start talking about the decisions that needs to be made. And you start mapping them out. And you can see that, well, this decision depends on that one. These two are even looping. And you can sort of start actually externalizing, visualizing your decision-making process. You can start talking about it. One thing to think about when you do this is keep all of the decisions at approximately the same level. So don't mix different levels of abstraction, essentially, in your, in your decision map. When you do that, you can create decision systems. A decision system is essentially when you start seeing recurring patterns in these, you can sort of figure out that on a micro or macro level, you can figure out when to apply different patterns and you can externalize those. And you can build a knowledge base on how to create decision systems. Instead of informational systems, you create decision systems because the decisions are what will drive your outcomes. You'll also realize something that's pretty amazing and that's that is that decisions can suck. Totally. <clears throat> and what do we mean by that? Well, decision suckage is essentially if you take an index card, you write a decision on it, this is the decision that needs to be made, and you put up the information you need, and you stick that on a wall, you got a decision Kanban, right? It will actually start pulling in or sucking in the information it needs. You'll also find that if you have multiple pieces of information you need, you can actually often preempt it. And you have it all visualized, you can talk about it, you got a wall of great things, and you're actually not. You're sort of always starting with a need and you're pulling in exactly the bits of data you need. Isn't that great? Instead of sort of collecting stuff up front and hoping it's useful, you're actually just pulling in exactly what you need. That's reducing waste, that's focusing on flow efficiency. So how would that work in practice? So say that you have a decision to make. Should I run away from this? Well, I know, it's kind of cute, uh, gut feel. So let's, let, let, let's create a card from that. Um, so should I run? That's what I need to figure out. Uh, the information I need is the threat level. Is this mommy spider uh, fearful enough? Then I'll probably run without figuring out what the other decision points are. How far away is it? And what shoes do I have? That, that's some sort of things that we could say, essentially, we'll govern this. And we start collecting this data. And if we sort of figure out that, well, third level high enough, run. Then we can actually preempt the distance and shoes discussion. We sort of just ignore those. It doesn't actually matter. This data point dominates the other ones. We know what the decision is. Move it to done, move on, pick the next decision, start working on that one. That's fairly easy, right? That's something you can go back and start doing tomorrow. So say you run up to this guy instead. What metrics matters in this case? Well, it sort of depends, but say you're running up to this guy and you got a friend with you. Then what metric matters? Are it, are it the same ones? 
Yes, how, how fast is my friend? So that's the ephemeral part. So our threat level doesn't actually figure into this discussion, but the information I need in this case is, am I faster than the other guy? Because as long as I'm that, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but that's the thing. We need to actually assess each situation and each decision and each decision over time based on what's the most important bit of information I need, select a metric for that, build up and dismantle it as quickly as you can. Uh, would working without metrics imply no work getting done? No, and it, as you've heard, it doesn't actually usually imply not having no metrics. It just implies don't have metrics you're collecting just for the sake of it. Make sure for every met metric you're collecting, you know what decision you're going to take based upon it. If, you're not have, if you don't have a decision in mind, don't collect the bloody data unless you're doing research. But most of, our, of us aren't doing research. We're operational. Uh, that should leave three and a half minutes for questions, comments, and uh, general chatter. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a very quick sprinter, so I do 5Ks in 18 minutes. But I can keep on running for about 19 hours. So you know your, uh, your framework for the podium? Yes. And you talked a lot about decisions, but I didn't hear much about um, how, you know, when you said you were going through this. I know the outcomes are context sensitive, but I didn't hear you even the reason is that the outcomes are so contextual. They're up to you. So what do you desire? What are the needs we have? What, are, what is the purpose, essentially? So we need to mine them from that. And that's the thing. Unless we have that, collecting the data won't actually help us. So that's why it, it, it's you select that one. I can help you with the other pieces. Outcomes, uh, th it's, a, it's a really fine question. So I'm talking about outcomes, and then I say, well, you can't work directly on those, and, we can't, and so we sort of shouldn't think about them. What we really need is leading indicators. Uh, the thing is that we have something we desire. That's the outcome we want. In order for us to move in that direction, we need to take action. Taking action, that can be the leading indicator. The leading indicators are based upon the theory of what will move us towards our purpose or outcome. So, and that's, a, that's where we should focus. We should focus on the behaviors that will, in our theoretical framework, drive us towards our outcome, the outcome we want. And we should also build into that a feedback loop that tells us if our actions are actually working. So we need to update our theory based upon the outcomes we really get. If I think that sitting on my couch eating potato chips is very likely to make me a fast sprinter, I got a theory. And I can have a leading indicator of how much potato chips can I actually eat in an evening. But I also need to verify it with the lagging outcome, the lagging indicator that's my speed over a short distance. And somewhere along the line, I need to actually figure out that, well, my theory is flawed. I need to go back and find better leading indicators. Does that help you? Uh, can you give an example of a leading indicator? About not like a mantra or something, but something like a real world. What should we use as a leading indicator? Like a leading metric? Whip. Whip is one. Fo uh, if, uh, if we believe focusing on having a uh, little work in progress is good, then I can actually 
influence that directly by not taking on more work, by not overburdening myself. Sorry, that's all the time I got. <laughs> That's an excellent one. Anything else? Actually, you get sort of like five minutes to switch rooms if I remember the schedule right, so.